And now to the Rothschilds, uh, who, along with the Medici, I think, and the uh, perhaps uh, Pierpont Morgan are synonymous in our minds with uh, bankers as collectors. Pippa Shirley read history at Oxford and art history at the Courtauld Institute in London before working for a short time in publishing. She then joined the Department of Medieval and Later Antiquities at the British Museum before moving to the Victoria and Albert Museum, where she was responsible for the continental silver collections and worked on decorative ironwork and English and European silver galleries. In 2000, she went to Wadston Manor as head of the collections, where she has worked on a variety of subjects, including the history of the House and Rothschild family and the history of collecting. Today, we are delighted that Pippa has come to New York and to the Frick to speak to us about old pictures, old cabinets, old China, the Rothschilds as collectors. Please welcome Pippa Shirley. Thanks. Well, hello everyone. Can you all hear me? Good. Um, and thank you very much indeed, first and foremost, to Ian and to Inga for inviting me to come. I'm honoured to be speaking at this gathering. Um, I also bring greetings from Lord Rothschild, who is very sorry not to be here in person today. Um, and also, just before I begin, I just wanted to acknowledge my great debt to the work of others on the Rothschilds and on the Wadston collections, um, work from people who include Michael Hall, who wrote the wonderful book on the manor, um, Wadston, the biography of a Rothschild house, Niall Ferguson, whose name was mentioned yesterday, um, and my two colleagues, of course, at Wadston, um, Ulrich Leben, who I'm delighted is here today, and um, Selma Schwartz, the two people I want to mention in particular. So, to move on to the Rothschilds, my abstract for this paper announced that I aim to explore the patterns of collecting of the Rothschilds, a family as renowned for their accumulations of art and decorative art as they were for their financial brilliance, taking as its starting point bric-a-brac, an 1897 essay by Ferdinand de Rothschild, which has only recently been published by Michael Hall in Apollo. And for those of you who haven't yet discovered bric-a-brac, I'm going to quote from it extensively, but I do recommend that you read it because it's a really fascinating insight into the mind of a collector, which analyzes the impulses and motives of the collector in the context of earlier generations of his family. By comparing Ferdinand with other family members and looking in particular at the Rothschilds who succeeded him at Wadston, I wanted to look at whether his deliberate self-distancing from the family business, because as soon as his father died and he came into his inheritance, he asked for his share of capital from the bank to be released that he could concentrate on collecting philanthropy, politics, his life in London and the country, travel, writing and entertaining, and whether this made a material difference to his activities as a collector, and whether it's possible to distinguish any influence which his membership of a great financial dynasty played. Was the success of the bank a factor in the choices which the family made as collectors, or was it simply a means to an end? Did Ferdinand and his relatives regard their collections as investments? How important was value for money? Did the quality of the objects they collected need to reflect their financial success and status, or were other factors at play? What role did philanthropy, if any, play? Of course, I soon realised that to cover this much ground in 25 minutes was wildly ambitious for a 20... Um, and also that I wouldn't possibly be able to answer all of those questions, but I will at least make a stab at some of them. So this is Judengasse, which is where the story all began. Um, the Rothschilds were and are an extraordinary family in many respects, and the story of their emergence from the in the 18th century from the relative obscurity of the Jewish ghetto in Frankfurt to become one of the world's financial superpowers by the end of the 19th century is well known to everyone here, as are the trappings which this brought, the houses, the vineyards, the racehorses, and of course the stupendous collections which still astonish today, the English 18th century portraits, the Dutch Golden Age paintings, the Sèvres and Meissen porcelain, the 18th century French furniture, the manuscripts, the books, the drawings, the textiles, the boisseries, the silver, the kunstkammer pieces, the gold boxes, I could go on. They are almost equally renowned for the building of opulent palaces in which to entertain and to showcase their collections. But it is, though, perhaps just reiterating um, the early history of the family. And again, you heard a little bit about this yesterday. The five branches of the family, the arrows of the family crest, were established across Europe by the five sons of Meyer Amschel Rothschild, the founder of the dynasty. Meyer, who was born in 1743 or 44 in Frankfurt, made his reputation as a dealer in ancient coins and antiquities, and also as a provider of mercenaries, as we heard yesterday. The capital from these activities was ploughed into the banking business. The roles of dealer in precious metal objects and banking have historically always been closely intertwined, through which he came to the attention of the Landgrave of Hesse Castle. 
He and his wife, Gutler Schnapper, had 19 children in all, 10 of which survived adulthood, five girls and five boys, who you're seeing on the screen now. While the eldest, Amschel Meyer, stayed in Frankfurt with his father, the second, Salomon Meyer, established the bank in Vienna, Nathan Meyer went to Manchester and then to London, Karl Meyer went to Naples, and James Meyer to Paris. So this pan-European context, then, was Ferdinand's background, his DNA, if you like. He was from the Viennese branch of the Rothschilds, the fourth child of Anselm, who was in turn the only son of Salomon Meyer. Anselm had married his cousin Charlotte, daughter of Lionel, head of the English branch of the family. And Ferdinand was born in Paris in 1839, but the family then moved to Frankfurt and thence to Vienna in 1848 when Anselm took over the running of the bank. Ferdinand himself, thanks to his English mother, was always intensely Anglophile, and his English relations were amongst the most important in his family. He followed his father's, in his father's footsteps with an endogenous marriage to his English cousin Evelina, which brought him even closer to his uncle Lionel, who became something of a role model as a collector. And the couple settled in England, at first in London, in a house on Piccadilly, next door to both his father-in-law and the Duke of Wellington. Ferdinand was devoted to his mother, seen here in a self-portrait, painting her husband Anselm with a nanny and the eldest of their seven children. She was an artist and passionate about interior decorating and gardening. The interior which he depicts here includes a glazed cupboard containing silver gilt standing cups and small sculpture which was part of Anselm's collection. His father was undoubtedly the single most significant influence upon Ferdinand's life as a collector, even though he found him distant as a parent. Anselm's interests were silver and silver gilt, small-scale sculpture and Kunstkammer pieces, gold boxes and Dutch 17th century paintings, enthusiasms which he was to pass on to his son, and he was indefatigable in pursuit of them. In 1868, in a letter, Ferdinand describes him obsessively hunting down curiosities. He would rise at six o'clock and remain on his legs until dusk, dragging his unfortunate gentleman, by whom means his valet and his secretary, with him, shopping and sightseeing. I wish he had handed down his constitution to his sons. Anselm's collecting increased in pace towards the end of his life in 1874, and the fruits of this activity were documented in two illustrated catalogues by Frank Schestag, the first of which was published in Vienna in 1866, with a second edition in 1872, and he also exhibited at the World Exhibition in Vienna in 1873. By the time he died, the collection was truly extraordinary, a 19th century expression of a 16th century Kunstkammer, which the Rothschilds of the family were so keen to emulate. 16th and 17th century goldsmith's work, an objet de vertu, Renaissance jewels, ivory, rock crystal, and limoges enamel. It included this pair of objects, both by the Dresden court sculptor Balthazar Pomosa, probably made for Augustus the Strong. These are amongst the few objects Ferdinand inherited from Anselm's collection that are still at Wadston. It also included pieces such as the famous Holy Thorn reliquary, acquired only two years before Anselm's death, and made for the Duc de Berry to hold a thorn from Christ's crown of thorns, made around 1405. This, arguably the most important piece in the collection, also underlined Anselm's, and indeed the Rothschild family's generally, general willingness to acquire ecclesiastical art if it was of high enough quality, provenance, and interest. The same can be said for Baron Edmond, Ferdinand's cousin from the French branch of the family, who we'll hear a bit more about later on, who assembled a spectacular collection of books of hours and other devotional manuscripts. Anselm's collection also included the so-called Cellini Bell from Horace Walpole's collection at Strawberry Hill, which Ferdinand more accurately identified as being by the Nuremberg goldsmith Wenzel Jamnitzer. Anselm's collecting was clearly of immense personal importance. In Bric-a-Brac, his son describes how he was never happier than in his museum room, where he was often to be found puffing away at his cigar and making a catalogue of his collection in the company of one Pluck, an Austrian dealer. Pluck, who remains a mysterious figure, was the successor to Moritz Daniel Oppenheim, the artist and dealer. Oppenheim was extremely close to the Rothschild family. He acted almost as unofficial family portrait painter. He was a professor at Weimar University and a friend of the artist Thorvaldsen. It was he who taught Charlotte, Ferdinand's mother, to paint. Ferdinand paints a vivid picture of a typical Oppenheim visit to his father in Bric-a-Brac. I cannot describe the joy I felt when he unpacked some quaint Nuremberg or Augsburg tankard, or the figure of a lion, or a man, or a stag, which was weighed and bought by weight. Oh, for the good old days when the artistic merit of a cup was of no account to its possessor, and he merely valued it according to the number of ounces it contained. That's quite a significant statement. When it came to his own collections, Ferdinand seemed not to have relied as closely on individual advisers. He certainly had favoured dealers, Wertheimer, Agnews and Charles Davis among them, 
but he seems to have made his decisions largely by himself. Ferdinand goes on to make some keen observations about what motivated his father as a collector. Anselm, Ferdinand remarked, might have formed a matchless collection, for he lived in a country where old works of art were deemed worthless, and he had the Austrian market all to himself. But his taste was limited to a small range, as he cared for minute articles only, presumably like the Van Blarenberg plaques, which are on the screen now, besides which his time was much too occupied with business to enable him to devote much of it to other pursuits. How was it, I once asked him, that in the days when you had such facilities for acquiring almost anything you chose, and at your own price, that you made so few purchases? I was less keen then than I was now, he replied, and there was less emulation. Yet, even when there was no lack of emulation, he could never be persuaded to pander to the new fashion for 18th century art. It is clear that the enduring value of works of art was important to Anselm, not so much because he intended to sell them on, but as recognition of their, uh, of their status as long-term investments. This was important to his son too. Again, in his own words, it may be admitted that owing to the great extension of wealth and luxury throughout the world, when 12,000 guineas is given for a brood mare, 1,000 for a hack, 300 for a postage stamp or an orchid, and when no limit is set to the gratification of a fashionable whim, fine and genuine old works will continue in the same demand, and as the supply diminishes, the demand will increase. For upwards of 30 years, economists and moralists have been predicting a crash in the curiosity market, and have been warning the collector that one day he would be overtaken by a most terrible retribution. The collector, while smiling incredulously, deplores the spread of the mania, but he deplores it for a very different reason. Ferdinand's own collecting, as we have said, was immensely influenced by his father and Rothschild collecting patterns in general. The early experience of exposure to his father's collections, and indeed to the exposure of the family houses, had an undeniable impact. In Bric-a-Brac, he describes the deep impression that these extraordinary works of art had made, and how, as a child, he was allowed to help pack up the collection for safekeeping when the family decamped to their summer home in the country, and then help rearrange the objects again when they returned, and how merely to touch them sent a thrill of delight through my small frame. He went on to analyze not only what he saw as a fundamental human urge to collect, but sets his family in a wider context. Of late years, he writes, the accumulation of works of art of earlier periods has become a recognized institution, and the taste for bric-a-brac has developed to an almost universal mania. In every country, private collections are formed of all styles of old art, from antique statues to buttons and shoes, for the discovery of which the palace and cottages ransacked, and for the acquisition of which unimaginable extravagances are committed. He goes on, among the majority, there are many, doubtless, who collect purely for amusement and the excitement collecting affords. Others from vanity and imitation of their betters. Others, again, who fancy that by filling their houses with old pictures, old cabinets, old china, they establish a claim to consideration. Ferdinand himself was driven by various factors, family background, a keen aesthetic sense, and as he said himself, the excitement of the pursuit, something which comes out very much in his surviving correspondence. He was a keen historian, scholarly and well-read, with a particular fascination for French 18th, century, his, um, French 18th century history, publishing on the subject on several occasions. This context was important for his collecting. Although always keen to secure pieces of exceptional style or manufacture, what often drove him was provenance. As he said himself, old works of art are not, however, desirable only for their rarity or beauty, but for their associations, for the memories they evoke, the trains of thought to which they lead, and the many ways they stimulate the imagination and raise our ideals. The other critical factor, of course, was that Ferdinand had the means and the leisure to pursue his interest in collecting. Ferdinand was of the generation of Rothschilds who were able to reap the rewards of the successful management of the business by their predecessors. While his elder brother Nathaniel was required to enter the family business, Ferdinand was not so constrained. Although early on he was involved in the running of the bank, and indeed, during his travels between Paris, London, Vienna, and Frankfurt, he acted as a kind of unofficial antiquity scout for other members of the family. He sold his shares immediately on the death of his father, which made him independently wealthy. When his father died in 1874, he left the almost unimaginable amount of 50 million thalers, which I think, I'll have to check the sums, having heard you earlier on, Robert, um, was, amounts to almost 7.3 million pounds in his will. Not surprisingly, Ferdinand's collecting increased exponentially after this point. We see the interface between the enduring influence of Anselm and, on his son and Ferdinand's own taste most clearly in the contents of the new smoking room at Wadston, 
an interface made more poignant for those of us who work at the manor because it is no longer there, but now to be seen as the Wadsden bequest at the British Museum. A sizable proportion of the 600 plus objects recorded in Schiestag's catalogue of Amsalm's collection were inherited by Ferdinand, including gold boxes and Dutch 17th century paintings, as well as part of his Kunstkammer collection. Ferdinand then, through his lifetime, more than doubled the collection, creating an assembly of pieces which it was acknowledged at the time had no parallel and would be unlikely ever to be bettered, either in the private or public realms. Once Ferdinand had built Wadston, his Renaissance Museum, as he called it, was displayed together in a single room with purpose-built showcases. The terminology is significant, showing that he regarded it as a particular discreet area of his collection. His bequest of the smoking room collection to the British Museum, of which he'd been made a trustee in 1896, the year before his death, was partly made in settlement of taxes imposed by the new regime for death duties, and partly because of a lack of direct heir. But there also seems to have been another underlying motive, which was to do with Ferdinand's belief that collections such as his were in private ownership, only in transit from their original owners to public, the public enjoyment of them, a kind of inexorable liberal movement for the common good. He explored this idea in one of his essays in 1885. In The Expansion of the Art Market, he wrote, Newly formed collections are generally more accessible in their new homes than in their former secluded retreats. The more works of art change hands, the better they become known, and the more thoroughly and permanently they inculcate the taste for and knowledge of art and, insist, and assist the education of the people. And when they are absorbed into some public institution, they act as a safeguard against mediocrity by affording a standard of excellence. He also recorded his fear in the Red Book, his memoir of the creation of Wadston, that on his death, Wadston would fall into decay, that the weeds will spread over the gardens, the terraces crumble into dust, the pictures and cabinets cross the Channel or the Atlantic, and the melancholy cry of the nightjar sound from the deserted towers. He was not alone in fearing the worst for the future of private collections. Just as his will was being drawn up in 1897, the bequest of Lord Hertford's collection to the nation by his daughter-in-law, Lady Wallace, which is now, of course, the Wallace Collection in London, and that of the Duc de Mal of his Chateau of Chantilly to the Institut de France was announced. This was surely a vindication of Ferdinand's belief that collectors may deplore the fact, but it should be a source of satisfaction to the public, that most fine works of art drift slowly but surely into museums and public galleries. In private hands, they can afford delight only to a small number of persons. Another motivational aspect of Rothschild family collecting, which comes across very strongly, both in Brickerback and in Ferdinand's surviving correspondence, is a spirit of competition which spanned the generations. He recounts with some indignation a clash which occurred during the sale of the Pommersfelt collection in the 1850s. His mother, who had viewed the sale, saw some stamped leather wall hangings which had particularly caught her eye. By coincidence, writes Ferdinand, Baron James, the head of the French branch of the family, was coming to Frankfurt at the same time, and my mother, in the innocence of her heart, spoke to him of the leather in terms of glowing admiration. Baron James never moved a muscle and maintained the most discreet silence, but on the following day, he posted off to Würzburg and bought the leather for his chateau at Ferrières, of which it is now the chief ornament. On another occasion, the dealer Wertheimer was involved in a contretemps in 1871 between Ferdinand and his French cousin, Gustave, when the latter was sold a pair of serre vases which Ferdinand had acquired to make a garniture with his ship vase, but offloaded back to Wertheimer when he found something better. The vases turned out to have Minton bases. Ferdinand compensated Wertheimer and ensured Gustave was not out of pocket, so all were ended well eventually, and he also claimed, I think slightly, um, in a slightly kind of unlikely way, that uh, Ferdinand this is, that he'd never actually turned the vases over, so he'd never noticed the fact they had a Minton mark on the bottom. <laughs> The other aspect, of course, of all this collecting was the creation of appropriate settings in which to keep the objects. The great Rothschild houses, of which there were over 40 across Europe by the end of the 19th century, fulfilled a dual purpose. They were not only places to display and accumulate objects, they were for entertaining, for gathering friends and family, a supreme statement of status, of social, political, cultural and financial achievement. Although it is important to remember that it was not his only house, and he was collecting for the London house on Piccadilly as well, Wadston Manor was Ferdinand's most evolved expression of this, and indeed one of the only such houses to survive with its collections intact. He bought the land in 1874 from the Duke of Marlborough, and then commissioned a French architect, Gabriel Hippolyte Détailleur, who had worked for other members of the family, to build him a house modelled on the 16th century Loire Chateau and royal palaces he so admired. This creation, The Labours of Sisyphus, by Ferdinand's own account, 
entailed the levelling of the bare conical hill, the cutting of drives and terraces, piping in of water from six miles away, the construction of a spur railway and tramway to, build, to, to bring materials to the site, and the importation and planting of mature trees with which to landscape the gardens. Only a Rothschild would have contemplated such an enterprise. Outside, in a landscape peopled by sculpture and fountains, some 17th and some 18th century, some copies after the antique, formal areas of extravagant carpet bedding gave way to more natural, naturalised parkland vistas. An aviary was created, and polemite grottos for rare deer, goats and sheep, although Ferdinand stopped short of the menagerie created by his cousin, his naturalist cousin Walter, at nearby Tring Park. All of these delights were designed with the other main purpose of the manor in mind, which was as a place for entertaining. Wadston was never intended as Ferdinand's sole residence, but rather as a weekend retreat, a place where he could invite family and friends who included figures such as the Prince of Wales, the future Edward VII, who's seen here at the centre of the group gathered on the South Terrace. And the Prince of Wales is, where is he? There he is. Um, and this is Ferdinand here, looking a bit miserable. And back here, uh, sorry, can't see because of the angle. Um, uh, back here with the rather splendid whiskers there, that's Alfred, Ferdinand's cousin, who had a house nearby at Halton and with whom Ferdinand had a very close but very competitive relationship. His house parties, which took place at weekends in the summer, soon became legendary. Guests were surrounded with every imaginable luxury and enjoyed the finest foods and wines. Ferdinand's chef had previously worked for the Tsar of Russia. Showing off the growing collection was as much a part of the entertainment laid on for guests as a trip to the aviary, the glass houses, or the ornamental dairy. The interiors of the manor, designed by Detailleur to Ferdinand's concept, were a homage to the country and period that Ferdinand most admired, 18th century France. In Bric-a-Brac, Ferdinand writes, whether it is to the credit of my family or not may be a matter of opinion, but the fact remains that they first revived the decoration of the French 18th century in its purity, reconstructing their rooms out of old material, reproducing them as they had been in the reigns of the Louis, while at the same time adapting them to modern requirements. It only takes a glance at one of the interiors at the manor, in this case the grey drawing room photographed in 1897, to see that this was, to modern eyes at least, a curious claim. The proportions of the room and ceiling heights alone are hardly 18th century. But Ferdinand's antiquarianism was genuine and founded in a deep understanding of the period as it was understood in the 19th century. In another essay, this time in 1892, French 18th century art in England, he explains that one of the reasons the popularity of French 18th century art for collectors was that it was easy to live with, more practical, as he put it, than Renaissance art, which although more admirable as art, was best shown in a museum or in a discreet room or gallery. In any case, in Ferdinand's eyes, the modern requirements were almost as important as the artistic, whether it was the comfortable 19th century furniture or the underfloor central heating, first gas, and then electric light and the installation of a lift, which helped to make a stay at Wadsden such a, lu a luxury. The red drawing room at the manor acts as a kind of visual key to what is often referred to as the Rothschild style. Ferdinand and his family were, were, were by no means the first to reuse earlier wall coverings and panelling, but they were the first to combine French 18th century decorative arts with English 18th century portraiture, a combination which was later adopted with some enthusiasm across the Atlantic. Here in the red drawing room can be seen portraits by Reynolds and Gainsborough, garnitures of Sèvres porcelain, marquetry furniture by Reasoner, a Savonnery carpet, curtains which are a 19th century reweaving of an 18th century dress fabric, all set off by red brocade silk walls and gilded wood and plaster door, door cases and cornices. What is interesting is that Ferdinand does not seem to have regarded his 18th century treasures as his collection as such, in the way in which he did the smoking room collection, but rather as furnishing for the house. The Savonneries were to be walked upon, letters were to be written at the Louis XVI desks, the Beauvais tapestry-covered chairs to be sat upon. This helps to explain the complexity of some of the interiors, where the historic pieces jostled with large quantities of modern furniture. But everything had to have its place. In 1888, he wrote to the picture dealer Agnew, refusing a painting because it would or could not possibly be placed advantageously in any room of the house. Collecting, therefore, was not an end in itself. The paintings are amongst the chief glories of Wadsden, and ranking high amongst its stars are the English 18th century portraits. The Rothschilds as a family were exceptionally keen collectors in this field, and indeed were credited with turning the market for Gainsborough in particular, which had been in decline in the mid-19th century. This, then, was an example of a family keen to collect high-quality objects, identifying a gap in the market. 
but it was also an example of the influence of Ferdinand's uncle and father-in-law, Lionel, who was the first to focus on English painting and thus led the way for the next generation. Ferdinand's first Gainsborough was the famous pink boy, Master Thomas Nichols, which he bought from Agnew in 1879 for, for £5,512 and 10 shillings, but for his London house, 143 Piccadilly, rather than Wadston. We do not know how much he paid for the Gainsborough of the Prince of Wales, the future George IV, painted in 1784, but it is interesting in the context of the collection as a whole, partly because of its place in the Red Drawing Room, the first main reception room of the house, in which Ferdinand was in a sense establishing his credentials as a collector. Here it hangs next to a marble portrait medallion of Louis XIV and overlooks a Savonnerie carpet designed around a head of Apollo, Louis' emblem, establishing a kind of hierarchy of collectors and illustrating Ferdinand's key aspirations. Another category which deserves a mention of the so-called Dutch Golden Age subjects, now mainly gathered in the morning room at the manor. As with gold boxes, Dutch and Netherlandish painting was a passion for many members of the Rothschild family. Ferdinand's father Anselm and great-uncle James both had highly important collections, and Ferdinand records how he and his cousins would sometimes band together to, to buy entire collections en bloc, as happened with the famous Van Loon collection in 1877. The painting on the screen, Ter Bork the Duet, painted in 1675, was part of another major collection, that, that of the Sixth Family, which was bought in its entirety by Ferdinand in 1897, the year before he died. And it was interesting to see the Bearings version of this picture in, um, in Charles's presentation earlier. The tower drawing room, seen here in a photograph from the Red Book, also combined comfort and antiquarianism. It was in this room, the innermost sanctum, accessible only through his private sitting room, that Ferdinand originally displayed his Renaissance Museum in purpose-built showcases. At the time that this photograph was taken in 1897, the collection had been moved upstairs to the new smoking room in the bachelor's wing, and the room was remodelled with a set of panelling of 1773, the only set of neoclassical panelling in the house. At the same time, it was hung with French 18th century paintings, another area of interest, not portraits, but fête champêtre and fête galante, popularised by Watteau in the early 18th century. On the right, the wedding breakfast by Lancre is just visible. Uh, ooh, where's it gone? Over there. Above is a set of female heads by Jean-Baptiste Greurs. Ferdinand had loved Greurs from childhood. In bric-a-brac, he described how he had a particular fancy for a head of Greurs in his father's collection, and much to my mother's amusement, I would kneel on the floor, fold my hands up as if in prayer, and screw up my eyes in mimicry of the picture, and often, when a visitor was announced, I was invited, to my great satisfaction, to go through the performance. One wonders what the visitor thought. Gold boxes were another category of object which appealed across generations of the family. Perhaps the most sing single most striking aspect generally was the pursuit of boxes bearing miniatures by the Van Blarenbergs, which form a distinct group alongside the mounted hardstones, ivory and tortoiseshell, chagrin and boxes mounted with serve plaques, painted enamels, and large numbers of objets de vertu, etuis and necessaires, flasks and the like. Between them, Ferdinand and his successors, Alice and Edmond, had at least 41 boxes, miniatures, rings and watches by or attributed to the Van Blarenbergs. Objects such as this, combining matchless technical skill and craftsmanship, beauty and social and historical interest, were irresistible to a family so focused on 18th century France. The two famous Choiseul boxes, one showing the Duc de Choiseul's country estate, Chanteloup, to where he was sent in disgrace following his fall from political favour in 1770, and dating to 1767, the miniatures, and 1748-9, the box. Um, and the other, on the screen on the far side, which is a Choiseul box, with depictions of the interiors of the Hôtel de Choiseul in the Rue Richelieu in Paris and dating to 1770, were both in Rothschild collections. The Chanteloup box was first owned by Nathaniel Rothschild, one of the sons of Nathan Mayer, the pillar of the exchange and the founder of the London branch of the bank. It then descended to his grandson, Baron Henri de Rothschild, whose grandfather moved to France and became naturalised there and is now across the road, of course, in the Metropolitan Museum, part of the Reitzman collection. The Choiseul box was possibly acquired by Baron Gustave, also with the French branch, and thence passed by descent to his son, Robert, and on to Baron Elie. This perfect little writing desk acts as an example of Ferdinand's pursuit of 18th century objects of royal provenance and of exceptional quality, and also reflects his fascination with Ancien Régime history. It was made in 1782 by Jean-Henri Griesner, Ebeniste du Roi, for Marie Antoinette's private apartments at the Petit Trianon and it was made en suite, of course, with a chest of drawers and drop-front secretaire, which are now here at the Frick. And Ferdinand acquired it from the celebrated collection of the Duke of Hamilton, who, through his wife Susan, inherited the collection of the antiquary and dilettante William Beckford. 
The Hamilton Palace sale in 1882, which we've heard referred to several times already, was a honeypot for European collectors, and several Rothschilds, including Baron Edmore and Ferdinand's sister Alice, bought at it. Ferdinand paid £6,000 for the desk, an astronomical sum for a piece of furniture, and was lampooned for his extravagance in the, in the newspaper The Times. Ferdinand's love of French furniture was only matched by his love of Sèvres porcelain, again an area in which he was in competition with other members of his family, as well as the wider world of 19th century collectors. These are the three ship potpourri vases in the collection at Wadston. Only ten survive anywhere in the world. The one on the left is particularly significant, since it was Ferdinand's first major purchase, brought before he'd come into his inheritance. He described in bric-a-brac how he was offered it by the dealer Alexander Barker, in Ferdinand's words, a very remarkable character who began life as an apprentice to a bootmaker, but who rapidly developed a thriving art business. Ferdinand first encountered him as a decorator for his uncle, Baron Meyer, who was building a mansion at nearby Mentmore. In 1861, when the 22-year-old Ferdinand brought the vase, Barker was already a great personage, residing at 103 Piccadilly in the most luxurious manner, driving the best steppers, giving the best dinners, and entertaining the best society. His taste was as fastidious as it had been good, and I never forget him saying, on showing me some beautiful roses that had been sent up from his hunting box, whatever I have is the best. Were I to have a jackass, it would be the best jackass in England. <laughs> even a Rothschild was impressed by this, and Ferdinand could not resist the vase, even though, as he said himself, he did not have the wherewithal to buy it outright and had to pay it off in instalments, living in dread of his uncles finding out. But it was a very good buy. The vases were amongst the most important and rare shapes ever made by Sèvres, designed by the goldsmith Jean Duplessis and fantastically difficult to make due to their open-work sales, which had nothing to support them in the firing. Ferdinand was not only interested in iconic single pieces and garnitures, however. He also acquired several services which were used for entertaining. It should be said he had a refreshingly um, unprecious attitude to quite a lot of his collections. He often used serve wine coolers as, um, to hold floral arrangements on the, on the mantelpieces in the drawing rooms at Wadston. And this particular service was supplied by Serve to Count Kiel Razumovsky in 1767, a favourite of Catherine the Great. It was decorated with paintings of birds, taken from the illustrations made by an English naturalist, George Edwards, for his History of Uncommon Birds, the first time that anatomically correct birds had been depicted on porcelain. Aside from its obvious art historical merits, it seems likely that the service also appealed to Ferdinand's love of birds. This was, after all, a man who had built a working aviary in his garden. But there are also collections at Wadsden which do not fit quite so readily into the Rothschild canon. Not surprisingly for a man as scholarly as Ferdinand, he was also fascinated by the more ephemeral records of 18th century society, anything indeed which threw light on the history and social customs of France. Um, this on the, on the left is a trade card from a fascinating collection of some 700 pasted into four scrapbooks, which Ferdinand secured from the sale of the library of his architect, Detailleur. Alongside it is a page from the Livre de Caricature by the saint family of artists, which is a collection of cartoons and drawings, many scurrilous, documenting the political, intellectual and moral shortcomings of the Ancien Régime, and which was clearly intended only for private circulation, as you can see from the rather risque cartoon on the right-hand side. For a man who wrote personal characteristics of French history, this was clearly fascinating primary source material and complemented both the collections of works of art and the 18th century books which he had started to accumulate towards the end of his life. These books and the engravings contained within them reflect many of Ferdinand's established interests, history and literature, social history, the theatre, court spectacle and festivity, natural history, travel, geography and topography. Although I've concentrated for most of this paper on Ferdinand and the insights he gives into the mind of a 19th century plutocratic collector, I want in the remaining time to look briefly at two other members of the family whose collections are also reflected at Wadston. The first is Ferdinand's sister, Alice de Rothschild. Born in 1847, she'd been living with her brother at Wadston and at her own neighbouring estate at Ethrop since 1874, having come to join him after the early death of his wife, Evelina, in 1866. Her familiar familiarity with the manor and his life there made Alice the obvious choice when the childless Ferdinand had to select his heir, and on his death in 1898, she duly became the Chatelaine of Wadsden. She seems to have seen her role as one of both perpetuating the life that he had lived and preserving his legacy. She continued to host house parties, although on a reduced scale at only twice a year, and she continued to pour her energies into the gardens, both at Wadsden and Ethrop, which reached their zenith under her care. Although she did not record the interiors of the manor systematically as Ferdinand did in his Red Book, 
The photographs that do survive show the essential character of the house unchanged. Guests, who included Sir Winston Churchill, Lord Kitchener and Henry James, continued to enjoy every possible luxury, although some visitors found their hostess could be both intimidating and a little strange. Ostley Morell, who visited in 1909, later described Alice as a lonely old oddity, and even Edward VII, who made a nostalgic visit to his old friend's house, was famously told to keep his hands off the furniture. <laughs> this concern to protect the collection was manifested in what became known later as Miss Alice's Rules for Housekeeping, which remain a significant force in the house and the management of the collection to this day. And I can tell you from personal experience that, that the spirit of Miss Alice is very much alive and well at Wadston. Alice witnessed the formation of Ferdinand's collection, which must have been a major influence on the formation of her own taste, a taste which she exercised while Ferdinand was alive and more energetically after his death. She must also have been aware of the collections of other members of the family, although she did not, as far as we know, record her responses in the way which her brother did. She's also interesting in the context of this paper as an example of a female member of the family who was active as a collector and also self-evidently as a Rothschild, but not as a banker. In broad terms, her taste seems to have followed familial lines, with some notable exceptions. An extremely early colour view of her sitting room at the manor, taken around 1910, shows an interior with a savonnerie carpet on the floor, red silk hung walls, densely hung with a variety of works on paper, including four of the original drawings by Moreau Lejeune for the famous edition of the Monument du Costume, made between 1775 and 1783, and one of the most iconic documents of 18th century court life, by which the Rothschilds were so fascinated. There are garnitures of Sèvres porcelain, sculpture, and on one wall a magnificent gilt bronze mounted commode by Riesner, made in 1776 for Louis XVI's sister in law, the Comtesse de Provence, and one of the finest pieces of French furniture at Wadston. It was bought by the dealer Watzheimer for £2,310 in 1882, at a time when Ferdinand was making some of his most important purchases. Alice's passion for porcelain was undoubtedly as great as Ferdinand's. Although she may not have bought the kinds of iconic objects that Ferdinand or even their cousin Edmond favoured, she had a good eye and an attraction to objects painted with birds. She also had more of a taste for painted furniture than her brother, although still sought out the most prestigious makers. And gold boxes were another area in which she followed in Ferdinand's footsteps. A glance through the Wadston catalogue reveals very little variation between Ferdinand, Alice and Edmond. Like her brother, she greatly admired the work of the Van Blarenbergs, Ferdinand and Alice between them had 41 miniatures, boxes and rings by or attributed to the Van, Va Van Blarenbergs, but where Ferdinand seems to have been drawn to objects commemorating great events in 18th century French history, Alice tended towards genre scenes in the spirit of David Tenniers, landscapes, seascapes and country pursuits. Alice's taste in paintings also had different aspects to Ferdinand's. She seems to have largely eschewed the Reynolds, Rumneys and Gainsboroughs, which her brother and the other members of the Rothschild family pursued so ardently. She also had no major equivalent of the Dutch Golden Age paintings. Perhaps here, as in other areas, she felt that she could not add meaningfully to her brother's achievement, or she simply didn't want to. But a glance through the Wadston paintings catalogue reveal other names, such as Joseph Highmore, Thomas Hudson, Reynolds master Francis Heyman, John Russell, and Daniel Gardner. In terms of continental painting, Alice again showed some individuality. Probably her most important work, although not one she actively sought, having inherited it from a Rothschild cousin, is the unusual portrait by Boucher of the young Louis-Philippe Joseph, Duc de Montpensier, later the Duc d'Orléans. And alongside the Longres and Watteau, she also acquired work by La Joux, Oudry, Charles, Greuze, and an Elizabeth Louise Vigier Lebrun, an artist beloved by 19th century collectors because of her close ties to Marie Antoinette. Alongside what might, one might call a classic Rothschild collecting patterns, Alice also developed a taste for more feminine sentimental objects. Here, she shared common ground with some of her female relations, in particular, Baron Edmond's wife, Adelaide, whose textiles, costumes, and accessories, she had an extensive collection of buttons and lace, are now also at Wadston. Alice collected textiles, too, and also into this category comes her collection of miniature silver furniture, most of it Dutch. The collection was displayed together in a green-lined cabinet in the green boudoir, the sitting room for the principal bedroom suite. The departure of the smoking room collection to the British Museum when Ferdinand died presented Alice with a dilemma, and her reaction throws a great deal of light onto what motivated her as a collector and her role as guardian of her brother's creation. Faced with what amounted to a major hole in the collections as he had conceived them, rather than putting her own stamp on the bachelor's wing, she set about replacing what had gone. Her acquisitions, though made in quantity, were discerning and made over a considerable length of time, suggesting a personal enthusiasm for such objects. We now know a little more about how she was buying thanks to the recent discovery of several sets of receipts in the archives. 
These are clearly only a sample, but they show a steady stream of acquisitions from 1904, tailing off after the outbreak of the First World War, and then resuming at a slower pace in 1918, including enamels, myolica, arms and armour, serve, gold boxes and paintings. The selections shown here are from Wertheimer and Harding, but the majority record transactions with Charles Davis, Kolnagy and Derlacher in London, Seligman in Berlin, and j and Goldschmidt in either Frankfurt or London. The sheer quantity of what was changing hands is staggering. If we take Goldschmidt alone, a quick calculation reveals in the 10 years between the 18th of May 1904 and the 6th of May 1914, there are 47 receipts for purchases, usually for multiple objects, at a total value of £152,602, um, which is over one-tenth of the value of her entire estate at her death. And that's just what survives for a single dealer. Her acquisitions included Limoges enamels, such as this dish decorated with Apollo and the Muses on Mount Parnassus, and Myolica was another active area. She acquired this Urbino dish from Charles Davis in 1908 for £225. Silver, silver gilt and jewellery had been a key component of Ferdinand's Kunstkammer. These Alice did not attempt to replicate in quantity, although she did acquire a handful of examples of metalwork. The most important of these is a magnificent cup, now known to be by Christian van Vianen, and made in London in 1660-61, to in the sophisticated auricular style for which he and his family were famous. We do not know when or where Alice acquired it, but it appears for the first time in her 1922 inventory in the smoking room. The portrait alongside it, incidentally, is a recent and serendipitous acquisition by the Rothschild Foundation um, of a boy holding that self-same cup, um, and a very unusual example of an of a de actual depiction of an object. And as you can see, when it was painted in um, 1657, it was not gilded, but the cup was later in the collection of the Duke of Sussex, and we think that that's when probably it acquired its golden coat. But perhaps the most striking example of Alice collecting in a man's world was her pursuit of arms and armour in the years after Ferdinand's death, when she was focused on the restoration of the Bachelor's Wing collection. Here, she had the assistance of Sir Francis Laking, Keeper of the Royal Armoury at Windsor, whom she clearly held in very high regard. Laking sold her one of the undoubted stars of the collection, a helmet which was part of a parade armour made by Carolim Carimolo Modrone for Emperor Charles V in the mid-1530s. This and a pair of elbow pieces from another of Charles V's parade armours remain at Wadston because, um, uh, this time, by, sorry, by Filippo Negroli, were left to Laking by Alice in her will, and they only remain at Wadston because Laking predeceased her. Despite, or perhaps because of Laking's input, the collection is a true reflection of the 19th century art market, with a predictable proportion of objects which have been improved. Many of these came through the hands of Frederick Spitzer, the Parisian collector and dealer, who Ferdinand refers to in bric-a-brac as leading la bande noire of predatory dealers. Before Alice's death in 1922, she faced a similar dilemma to Ferdinand. She was unmarried and so had no direct heir. So her choice fell on James de Rothschild from the French branch of the family and his young English wife, Dorothy. James and Dorothy had no country house of their own, but neither did they have any interest in collecting. James's passions were racing and golf, so in that respect, they were rather an astute choice. However, they are an important element in the story of Rothschild collecting for two reasons. It was James who bequeathed the manor and its contents to the National Trust in 1957, thus fulfilling Ferdinand's prophecy that his collection would eventually end up in the public domain. And it was also thanks to, Fer to James that a part of another phenomenal Rothschild collection ended up at Wadsden, that of his father, Baron, Fer Baron Edmond. Edmond, born in 1845, was the same age as Ferdinand and Alice, although as the youngest son of Baron James, who established the Paris branch of the family, he was actually from a generation earlier. Like Lionel of the English branch, and like his cousin, he was an indefatigable collector. Also like Ferdinand, he believed that the products of 18th century France represented one of the peaks of artistic patronage and achievement, and his house in Paris at 41 Rue Faubourg Saint-Honoré, which is now the American ambassador's residence, was a familiar synthesis of 18th century paintings, French furniture and porcelain, textiles and metalwork. He was more focused on French painting than Ferdinand. He had several Chardin, for example. He also amassed... Um, Oh, sorry, I got too out of order, I beg your pardon. He also amassed a highly significant collection of works on paper, both old master drawings, which are now in the Louvre, and architectural and design drawings, which are at Wadston, and also put together the finest collection of early Renaissance... Early, of, sorry, of early Renaissance manuscripts in private hands, which were divided, along with the rest of his collection, amongst his three children on his death. And so here I'm just showing you two of the, of the greatest pieces of, um, of, of Serve and of, and of French furniture, which again are, are two great enthusiasms of, um, uh, of Baron Edmond, as with, as with other members of his family. 
But I just wanted to finish by bringing you up to date with another aspect of Walston as a reflection of Rothschild collecting, which is, of course, that the story is continuing through Jacob, fourth Lord Rothschild, who has managed the manor on behalf of the National Trust since Dorothy's death in 1988. His time at the helm has not only seen a renaissance in the property generally and its scope and activities, but a number of significant additions to the collections. He's a collector in his own right, and many of the acquisitions in his time for Wadston have been in the best Rothschild tradition, 18th century silver, for example, and 18th century French painting, including a wonderful Chardin. But also, like Ferdinand, on the principle that they must have a place. But unlike any of his predecessors, he's keenly interested in contemporary art. Ferdinand was scathing about modern art, claiming it did not hold its value, and most of his relations shared this view. So it was not until the 20th century that contemporary collections of any significance started to be made by the family. At any event, at Wadston we have a chandelier commissioned for the house made of broken porcelain and fibre optic lighting by the sculptor Ingo Mara in 2003. Called Porca Miseria, it hangs in the blue dining room surrounded by 18th century French panelling. And also, I'm just going to very quickly show off now. Um, there's also a growing collection of contemporary art in a new building on the estate, opened last year to house the offices of the Rothschild Foundation and the Wadston Archive, which includes work by Anish Kapoor, Michael Craig Martin, Sarah Lucas, and Richard Long. But Windmill Hill, in a sense, brings us back again to Ferdinand and his public-spirited sense that the benefits brought by his great wealth and the fruits of family financial business acumen should percolate down through society, whether through collections moving into the public domain or his endowment of a children's hospital in memory of his dead wife. This building, as a home to a major charitable foundation, is a statement that the spirit of philanthropy in the family is as strong now as it was then, whether in support of a wide range of good causes or through the making of collections available for all to enjoy. Thank you very much. Thank you.